more about the misconceptions of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Bible. Great to have you back with us. Thank you. I do covet, as we say in the Baptist life, covet your prayers. My daddy called me at 5.30 this morning. And when I saw that that's who it was, of course, my heart jumped in my throat. And then he didn't answer. He, uh, the phone, there was someone I could hear noises, but no voice. And so I, uh, I and then it hung up. And so I called back and got the same result. And immediately called my brother, who lives only two miles away and is a paramedic, thankfully. And he got over there and called me, and sure enough, Dad had fallen just outside the house. And all the, we're waiting on the x-rays, but all my paramedic brother says all the external indicators are a broken hip. So here we go, a new phase in that experience. Uh, yeah, I'm quite nervous about it, but here we go. Um, all right, what are we doing today? Um, if you'll remember, I said last time that this whole issue is one of those things in, uh, they confront us in contemporary life when we want to make ethical decisions and take political stances and so forth that reflect our Christian faith, but the Bible doesn't give us any direct guidance for it. Right? We're, going to, we're going to bookend this study. With, we began with a look at uh, the whole question of Ishmael and his role, and, uh, the end of his, you know, uh, what we know about him quite early in the uh, <clears throat> we're going to conclude with some uh, study, a look at some texts in the Bible that have to do with uh, treatment of the sojourner, the resident alien, and have to do with uh, the continued role of Israel and God's plan for human history and so on and so forth. Uh, but in the middle here, we're going to do some, and I'm sorry, we're going to do some history, <laughs> plain old history. And, and boy, have I struggled with how to organize this. If you just try to go through a year-by-year -year thing, that really gets old. So I'm going to make some general claims and then read you off some examples to support right, from, from human history. Let's start with the general claim. Uh, and that is that there's something really extraordinary about the Jewish people in that they continue to be uh, as a people. Uh, in my mind, one of the strongest testimonies to um, the involvement of God in human history is the fact that there is an Israel today. Uh, because, if you remember, already in the biblical period, uh, 722, the Assyrians come in and they end the history of the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, that are not lost, by the way, they have dissipated. The Assyrian practice was to, take, to conquer an area, take half the population or thereabouts from the area they'd conquered, swap it with half the population from another area they'd conquered in the hopes that they would intermingle and intermix and any sense of national identity would go away and they would therefore be docile and easy to control. Guess what? That worked for the ten tribes. Now that leaves the tribe of Judah and uh, the assimilated tribe of Benjamin in the south. 586 along came the Babylonians and they exiled a huge population especially with the leadership and the priests and the royals and forth into Babylonian captivity. Part of uh, the outcome of that event was that a group of uh, Jews feared remaining in Judah under Babylonian uh, control and they fled to Egypt. So by the time, oh, by the end of the 500s, we have major populations of Jews living in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. And this is going to become the story of the Jewish people, the diaspora. Persia. During the biblical period, of course, now we have the Persian era and so on and so forth. And things. Those three major population groups continue to be where Jews live, although by Jesus' time and population estimates, in the doing population estimates for ancient time periods is difficult, as you can imagine. They didn't take censuses. Uh, but uh, the best guesses seem to be that there were something like twice as many Jews in Babylon, in Mesopotamia, as there were in Palestine in Jesus' day. And almost that same ratio between Egypt and Israel. There, there had been a time uh, back in the uh, 539 when Cyrus the Persian became the leading, 
became the dominant power in the region. He issued what was known as, I always love this, Cyrus issued the edict we refer to as the Edict of Cyrus, that way. <laughs> I used to remember. I mean, which he said basically not just to Jews, but to anybody else who had been exiled from their homeland. You can go home. And the prophet, uh, whose message is recorded for us in Isaiah 40 to 66, seemed to have great hopes that there would be this massive return of Jews from all over the world back to Israel. And the historical record suggests that this just didn't happen that way. There was a trickle. They rebuilt the temple in 515, and the prophet Haggai complains he's because it's more like a wood shack, he says, than it is a temple. That's the best we could do. Well, it was the best they could do, partly because not many of not many, they, they weren't very large in number, just very few. So already the issue of, uh, I mean, think about it. You, you've left, well, we're all, in a sense, everyone in this room, in a sense, is a di part of a diaspora of a sort. Um, my family came here from England one side of my family. Uh, in the not late 19th century, and I think if there was an edict of, you know, Elizabeth saying, all you people who whose ancestors left England in the 19th century can come home, I would say, well, for a visit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm home here, thanks. And that seems to be the way it was. We can continue that down until after Jesus. Um, the Jewish wars, AD 66 to 72 or thereabouts. Uh, and again, on the second Jewish rebellion, AD 132 to 135. Both of those were rebellions against Rome, as you know. And the second one, well, the first one <laughs> resulted in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, leveled it, the Romans did. Uh, that was the war that included the events at Masada, which were so, made so famous by the movie. Uh, and 80, the, the second rebellion, which was associated with Simon Bar Kokhba, uh, who proclaimed himself Messiah, by the way. That ended really bad. Uh, Hadrian <clears throat> uh, banned Jews from Jerusalem. Now this is going to be a condition which <coughs> continues on and off for the next, oh, 19 centuries. On and off. He banned Jews from Jerusalem. He built a pagan temple on the site of the, of the Jewish temple. He renamed Jerusalem Aeolia Capitolina. Nice Roman name. And he renamed Judea Philistia. So, we're up to that point. And I'm going to take you through a kind of a quick review of, of the Jewish diaspora. Because from that point, uh, by the 1400s or so, there are Jews in China. Can you believe that? Uh, that's hard for me to imagine that they have Chinese names. Uh, it's just hard to, hard to feed them, but, but it's true. Uh, <clears throat> there are Jews pretty much everywhere, <laughs> except to, except Micronesia. I think there aren't any, there aren't any Jews up there. Uh, but the question is, how did that come about? Uh, more important question is, uh, given our context, what were relations between Jews uh, on the one hand uh, and Muslims, Arabs, but Muslims? And on the other hand, Jews and Christians, because the thesis I would hang over today's lecture is, uh, in the context of that, you know, the question of whether the, the conflict between Israel, Israel and the Arab peoples goes back to antiquity, and the answer to that is no. My question, and the question I would ask today is, who treats Jews better historically? Arabs, Muslims, or Christians? <laughs> and you can guess what the answer is, can't you? Oh, historically, Muslims and Arabs treat Jews much, 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 much better uh, than Christians. Now let's characterize sort of the uh, underlying or overarching or whatever you want to call them, thoughts, ideas, principles 
that governed in the pre-modern era the way Christians related to Jews. And let's ask the same question about the way Muslims. Now, I should, because I'm going to, so I don't keep saying this over and over again. Uh, in the popular mind, Muslim equals Arab, right? Or Arab equals Muslim. Neither one of those is true. A lot of Arabs are Christians, a lot of Arabs are Druze, a lot of Arabs are, uh, they're a bunch of different uh, religions. A lot of Muslims are not Arab, right? Um, a whole lot of Muslims are not Arab. I don't know the statistics, but I'd bet only about half of the world's Muslims are Arab and the other half are not, or maybe more, I don't know. All right, first of all, how, what, what sort of ideas uh, govern the way Christians in the period beginning around 300 uh, down to the more or less modern era, contemporary era? What, what principles govern the way Christians dealt with Jews? Well, there are a handful. One uh, is the uh, doctrine, the false doctrine of uh, supersessionism. Have you ever heard that expression? Supersessionism? <coughs> It is the idea that the church supersedes Israel in God's economy. In other words, when Jesus came, died, and founded the church, Jews and Judaism don't matter anymore. No longer God's people. The church has superseded them. Uh, that was, is nowadays, rightly, by most Christian theologians considered to be wrong. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. What is right? It's hard. What is right is hard. What is wrong is easy, but wrong. Uh, but if you believe that way, then the continued existence of, of Jews and Judaisms, and Judaism, is a little bit of a problem, isn't it? Uh, there, if, if God has discarded them, according to the theory, then why can't you? So that's one. Uh, two is, uh, I kind of, this is kind of uh, harsh, but I'll use the term anyway. Christian superstitions. Um, I don't know when it originated, but one of the, and you'll hear me in a minute when I go through the history of uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish Christian relations in the, uh, ancient, in the uh, medieval period. You'll hear me talk about a bunch of times. Blood libel. Do you not know that term? Blood, I don't know where it originated, or quite why, but its earliest appearances are way back then, way back then. Um, there arose the belief that Jews typically used the blood of Christian infants in their Passover bread. <laughs> which is ridiculous, horrendous, and I wouldn't believe it, but in the ancient period, no, ancient period, from in the period we're talking about after Jesus, it was a standard uh, thing, would, the belief that that was what Jews in the local area were doing would pop up all over Europe every so often, along with the related belief that the Jews just love to get a hold of, of Eucharistic wine. Uh, because then they poured out, or uh, that was the, you know, and defame and def or profane uh, the Eucharist if they got a chance. That, that was the kind of thing that got passed around. Usury was a big uh, The Catholic Church proclaimed, and by we, when we use the term usury, we mean charging excessive interest. Uh, when the Catholic Church uh, banned it in the medieval period, it, they meant by it charging interest of any kind, period. And the, <laughs> and, the, and the Catholic Church ruled that Christians couldn't charge other Christians interest. And Jews had a similar rule, but that didn't mean that Jews couldn't charge Christians interest and Christians couldn't charge Jews interest. And the Jews were better at it than Christians were. They were better businessmen. And you know how you feel about the bank. <laughs> so that contributed. Uh, as did um, the, the notion of what we would call Jewish obduracy, 
those stubborn Jews refuse to believe in Jesus, even though their own Bible points to him, which it doesn't as clearly as we think it does. So you roll that all together, plus, plus a sort of otherness uh, that goes with Judaism. If, you, if you're familiar with a Hasidic Jew, right, except for maybe the black hat, certainly the, the, the fetlocks and everything else that character, will have characterized all Jews in the medieval period. Uh, so they just looked to other, behaved to other, stayed to themselves, all those kind of things. Uh, and all of that fed into the notion, uh, well, it built anti-Semitism, uh, which was alive and well by the, well, 400s, they did, and, and flourished and thorough and was nourished and so on and so forth until the modern era. How about uh, the notions of uh, what governed an er a Muslim attitude toward Jews? Well, um, there the, the uh, Quran talks a, a good bit about uh, what it refers to as Umar, which is related to the Hebrew word Am, and they both mean people, congregation doesn't mean ethnicity, it means something more like uh, a people group. And the Quran, it means really believers in a certain religion. Uh, the Quran, for example, in 1041 or 9 or 7, depending on what that, my handwriting says there. <laughs> uh, <it's>, anyway. <laughs> It says, to every Ummah was sent a messenger or prophet. Um, the, and the Quran talks about this, it's scattered across the Quran. I don't want to chase all those down. But in essence, the Quran says that there are three Ummah, three peoples, who are not infidels. Everybody else are infidels. And what characterizes an infidel? Well, the, the, the core confession of Islam is there is one God and Muhammad is his prophet. So let's take Judaism and Christianity. The most important part of that, of course, is there is one God, but only one God. Well, Judaism, Judaism's got that down. That's exactly what defines Judaism. So uh, Islam thinks, cool, guys, you know, you're not far from the truth. And Muhammad was his prophet. Oops, right? Not quite. Christianity. They Islam considers Christians confused monotheists because we say yes, we are monotheists, but we are trinitarian. Right? And uh, an is a Muslim will say to you if you get in conversation, explain this to me. This one God, but three sounds like three gods to me. Right? You're, you're playing with idolatry here, Christian. Do you, do you hear how that would go? Right? And Muhammad was his prophet. Whoops. Right. And that characterizes exactly how, when, for all of those years, uh, when, when Islam was influential uh, in big ways, as far as Spain, um, Muslims dealt with Christians and Jews. Muslims dealt with Jews as though they were slightly confused first cousins, right? If only they would acknowledge Muhammad. By the way, Islam acknowledges Moses and all the prophets and Jesus and uh, believes in the virgin birth, uh, all sorts of stuff, and the, and the, and the resurrection. Even. But not that Jesus is the Son of God incarnate. Uh, so you can imagine, you can imagine they dealt with the uh, with Jews as though they were, you know, first cousins who were just needed to acknowledge Muhammad. They dealt with Christians as though we were the, you know, adulated members of the family who just couldn't see the couldn't see the illogic in, in claiming to be monotheists and trinitarian at the same time. Right? I mean, how many of you? In, Believing Christians, scratch your head over the Trinity thing. 
<laughs> show your hand, show your hand. I thought so. Uh, and so explain what you believe in a convincing fashion to a Muslim. And convince the Muslim you're not a tritheist. Good luck. Yes? That's what I was just going to say, that there are plenty of Christians <coughs> You can't explain the Trinity. I can't, I can't explain the Trinity. Uh, I've studied how to explain the Trinity and go, I don't know, I believe in Jesus. I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. Uh, and so we're all. But I do know, uh, and this is just a word, to, you know, within the family, uh, we, sometimes, we have to watch ourselves. We sometimes get close to being tritheists without realizing what we've done. <clears throat> have to be careful about that. Have to be really careful. Yes. Also, <clears throat> was it one of the things that Christians held against the Jews? Um, and I, I've heard people say it even today that the Jews killed Jesus. Oh yeah, yeah. There's that. The Jews killed Jesus. That's. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, I feel there's an explanation for the Trinity, and um, I think it's at the same time acceptable. I, I mean, I, I'm a Trinitarian Christian. I understand yeah. that, but I'm but just I saying I'm I think there will be an explanation to Muslims, and still be open. Yeah. To yeah. What I'm trying, what I'm trying to get us to understand here, <clears throat> that you have to understand how a Muslim could hear some of I us do. explain the Trinity and go. <laughs> so what they typically do is they take our affirmation that we're monotheists and say, okay. And then they look at us like we're confused. We don't quite understand how confused we really are about what that means. But they say, if you say you're monotheist, okay, I believe you. Um, I had this discussion one time at a resort in the Caribbean. I saw this guy out on the, <coughs> on the dock and he was uh, rearranging his prayer rug and uh, Anyway, we got into a little bit of a discussion on it. And so, well, how do you know down in the Caribbean? How do you know which way is Mecca? <laughs> he said, well, just anywhere. Generally in that direction. <laughs> and anyway, we got in this discussion about the Trinity, and he said, we have, <clears throat> we have one God. He said, you have three. And he said, ours is better because we are more modern. Uh, we have a more modern prophet than Jesus. 600 years, yeah, that's what Anyway, that's a, that was a little bit of a discussion, I thought. <laughs> well, uh, I would say as much confusion as there is among, especially Western Christians, about what Islam is, there is equal confusion among Muslims about what Christianity is, but never mind that. Um, I'm trying to impress on you the notion that Islam is, by its very nature, more accepting of us than we are of it certainly more accepting of Jews because they don't have the Trinitarian problem that we do as far as the Muslim is concerned. Now, I want to illustrate, I'm going to do three things, I'm going to do this as quickly as I can and just list them off, you don't have to remember any of them, it's supposed to wash over you and make an impression, okay? I have been impressed by, I mean, because we don't have good records about this and how would we have? Imagine, the question is, how do Jews end up in China? Well, not in one big go, right? You have to imagine that a family migrates here, and a few years later another family migrates there, and so on and so forth. And after 14 centuries, the first thing you know, there are Jews in China, right? But we do have some documentation, some first references to Jews somewhere. And, and, and I want you, to, want you to get an idea, get in your mind, a map of the world and get an idea of the time frame. Uh, 691, for example, is the first reference to Jews in England. 711, um, Jews who were apparently already living in Spain ate, aided the Muslims who conquered Spain at the time. And they did so because they knew they would be treated better by the, by the Muslims than they were being treated by the Visigothic kings of Spain. 1,000, first reference to Jews in Germany, 
and to a Rabbi Gershom of Mainz who, who led to, who sort of founded the dominance of what we think of as Ashkenazi Jewish scholars. 1100, the Jews migrated from Germany to Poland, which they saw as the land of opportunity. 1120, uh, there are a group of Jews who settle in Byzantium, that'll be over Greek, Turkey kind of region. 1124, the first mention of Jews in Kiev, and as I said, 14, what is it, 1425, when we hear about this big, important Jew who did good service to the emperor of China, his name was Yin Qing, who was granted the privilege of having a surname. In Imperial China, that meant you were somebody if you had a surname. So there's that expansion. Why are they expand? Why are they spreading out that way? Oh dear. The next list is longer. This is uh, how Christians in the West treated Jews, a quick overview by century. Try not to be depressed. 425, Rome abolished the office of Nasi. Now that means prince. And uh, in the diaspora Jews in the early days had sort of somebody who was usually a descendant of David who they looked to as sort of the official leader of Jews all over the world. Um, the Romans uh, recognized him up until 425, and then they abolished the office. 439, the Romans decreed that no new synagogue could be built. 610, the Visigoth king of Spain, Sesbut, I love his name, S-E-S-B-U-T. <laughs> 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 now, banned Judaism, and um, they're always banning and expelling, uh, but if you don't ban a religion and you expel people, they come back. 627 to 69, Oraclius massacred Jews in Jerusalem, emptied Galilee, Judah, and Jerusalem of Jews. Most of them fled to Egypt. 722, Leo III of Constantinople undertook a campaign of forced conversion. 1078, George Gregory VII banned Jews from holding office anywhere in Christendom. 1096, there was a widespread massacre of Jews across Central Europe in about 20 cities. And just sort of seemed somebody got the idea, hey, let's kill some Jews. So they did. 1144. There was the, uh, a case of blood libel in Norwich, England. You remember me saying, you know, to use Christian baby blood to make a vessel. 1171, blood libel in Blois, France. 1181, the king, they were expelled, Jews were expelled from France. They were allowed to return in 1192 for a fee. 1190, a massacre in York, England, 1215. The Fourth Lateran Council required Jews to wear a yellow badge and the so-called Pilium Cornatum, a pointed hat, to identify them. What year was that? 1215. 12, 1229, uh-huh. You're going to hear about the yellow badge yeah, a lot. Yeah, it doesn't it? Yeah. It had a history that goes back to 1215, and, and it's 1229, I love this, the English King Henry II Tax the Jews, uh, tax the real estate of Jews in England at 50%. That's pretty serious, isn't it? 1243, blood libel and Berlitz, Germany. 1254, Louis XIV of France expelled the Jews again. Apparently the expulsion, expulsion a century earlier hadn't worked well or they snuck back in. Most of them fled to Germany because they thought they'd be safe there. 1267, the Vienna City Council ruled that the Jews needed to wear yellow badges and the Pilium Cornatum. 1275. 1282, all the synagogues in London were burned. 1275, I got this out of order. Edward of England required Jews to wear yellow badges. 
1285 in Norwich, or Norwich, I think it's the correct pronunciation. Norwich, blood libel, 1287 over Basel, Germany, blood libel, 1240 Jews were expelled from England, 1306 from France, 1321, Henry II of Castile, this is in Spain, required the yellow badge and the pointed hat, yes. Two questions. Um, <clears throat> is society throughout history persecuting Jews more than Christians and or Muslims in this instance? Because yes. they are the chosen people that they consider themselves the <coughs> chosen people. I mean, why? What, I understand all of the reasons you've given. Right. But there are reasons for these other religions as well. Well, well time out now. If you're talking Western Europe, what religions are we talking about? In the in the 1200s, Catholicism and Muslim Islam. No, not in France, not in Germany, not in England. In in, in that in those countries at that time, you you're talking Christian Roman Catholicism. Period. Stop. For well, you might say that in the England of 1282. There were Catholics and there were Jews. <coughs> Full stop. Um, 1322, expelled from France. 1385 to 86, good King Wenceslaus. I'm going to quit singing that hymn. <laughs> because he arrested all of the Jews in southern Germany and expelled them from Strasbourg. 1391, a campaign against Spanish Jews resulted in the killing of 10,000. 1420, they were expelled from Lyon, France. 1480, the Spanish Inquisition began, which was largely about Jews who nominally converted, converted to Christianity, but the Catholic Church didn't believe them. And they were tried to torture, torture them into telling the truth, which as it happened was that they had only nominally converted they were still practicing Judaism. 1492, the Alhambra Decree in Spain, which banished Jews from the whole country. By the way, it was formally revoked on December the 16th, 1968. Huh? They were expelled from Portugal in 1496. Now, I decided to stop this list in 1492 <laughs> because it was depressing. Uh, and because we're going to pick up with the Reformation next time and do some more <laughs> in-depth study of, the, of Jewish, Christian, Muslim relations in the modern era. Uh, that's the way we treat it, Jews. How about the way, I mean, yeah, how about the way Muslims did? Well, let's start in 570 with the birth of Muhammad. 614, the Persians invade the Middle East and they return control of Jerusalem to the Jews. At that time, there were about 150,000 Jews in Palestine doing their own deal. The Hajj was in 622. Muhammad died in 632. Shortly after his death, uh, I don't know how you can describe this either as the spread of a religion or the conquest of territory by a, an ethnicity. It's really both at the same time. The Muslims conquer Gaza in 634, Caesarea in 637. In 638, Caliph Umar captured Jerusalem and allowed Jews to return to the whole region. Could I answer? Yes. What were the Muslims before they were Muslims? <laughs> <laughs> were they just lots and lots of different religions? Okay. Uh, that's a very <laughs> No, I mean, I assume things sometimes and people don't know these things. Uh, um, Muhammad uh, grew up, he was, he was an interesting character. He, uh, 
he was, some think, illiterate, actually, um, and somewhat troubled. In the region around Mecca, he was, uh, he lived among Jews, Christians, there was a strong uh, presence of some Gnostic Christian sects, Manichaeans and so on and so forth there. And Arabs, uh, we're talking about Bedouin tribes and stuff like that. They were pretty, if you think of the genies of the uh, Tale of the not a Thousand Nights and, and, you know, Aladdin and all that kind of stuff, these genies are the, are the jinn, it's J-D-I-N-N, -N, uh, if you want to transliterate. The, they are minor, they are gods. The, 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 the Arabs around Mecca were polytheists. And the Christianity was unorthodox, and there were some Jews. Now, if you speak to a Muslim, you'll get the following version, that God appeared to uh, Muhammad in a series of trance, in a series of visions when Muhammad was in trance, and not in one go, but over the series, over a series of months and years, he dictated to Muhammad the Quran, which he memorized and then recited, and some people wrote it down. Um, if you talk to a non-Muslim scholar of religion, somebody like me, you would say that the Quran is a paraphrase of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, and that it shows evidence that Muhammad had soaked up all of that amalgam of religion around him and come, become convinced of one thing for sure. And that is that Arab polytheism was wrong and immoral and he became convinced, probably through his contact with Jews and with Christians, in monotheism. <coughs> uh, that didn't sit with, uh, he had a, a, early on a, a wide following, but it did not sit well with the families in the region who were economically and politically powerful. And so the early days of Islam were about um, Muhammad and his followers fighting for survival, uh, which they almost didn't attain and for fighting for influence in the, one family, the Umayyads, who were very powerful in Mecca, and in his, among his biggest opponents, later, and this, I think was, this was after Muhammad died, later converted to Islam, and, and they, in the history of Islam, uh, are the di are, have two dynasties, one in Syria and one in Spain. Uh, but early on, they were his opponents, and, and if I answer you, if I answered the question, who were they before they were Muslims? They were polytheists. Uh, now, that's the early Arabs. Now, as they expand into Turkey and Indonesia and all those kind of places, I don't know what those individual peoples were before they became Muslim, but they were some no, different in each case. Uh, have I satisfied that? Okay. <laughs> What's important is at this point that you hear that Caliph Umar welcomes Jews back to Palestine and gives them control of Jerusalem. It lasts. Because if you jump over to the other side, that's what the Crusades were about, among other things. 661 to 750 is one of these Umayyad caliphate. I probably need to tell you what a caliphate is or what a caliph is, don't I? All right, uh, unlike Christianity, Jesus died without, he didn't marry, didn't have children. Muhammad did marry, and have, but by the way, he married a wealthy widow woman the first time, which was part of the reason he was able to survive. He and his followers, he was no idiot. He married into influence and wealth. But he had children, and we, and the, the Muslims keep track of that lineage. And you can imagine that by now, there may be tens of thousands of people alive who claim to descend from Muhammad. If you rule a Muslim nation, a Muslim kingdom of some extent, and you descend from Muhammad, then you are a caliph. Right? That's the simplest way to put it. 
you hear about ISIS, the contemporary group talking founding a caliphate. It's not by definition because they don't have a descendant of Muhammad at their head. Yes. But the Sunni and the Shiites are they caliphates? No, they're denominations. Okay. Right. I am teaching the wrong course. <laughs> I should be teaching intro to Islam. <laughs> it's important to understand it. Now let's, let's pause and talk about this. Because our, America's recent foreign policy has gotten into the trouble it's in, partly because it didn't, we did not understand this. Um, what do you mean by recent? Uh, our invasion of Iraq. Um, um, we might still have done it, but we would have certainly done it differently if we'd understood what I'm about to say. Uh, the Sunni are like the Protestants in Islam. They tend to be more, they're not quite so radical. Uh, they tend to be business people, and professors. You know. The Shia are like uh, Apocalypticists, actually. Uh, they get their name, uh, they believe, we're back to caliphate now, by the way, the, that whole question. They believe that, I think it's the seventh descendant in charge in the original kingdom of the seventh descendant from Muhammad. <coughs> he, was, he was either murdered by a Sunni uh, opponent or <coughs> disappear to return one day. Yeah. Sound familiar? Yeah. And when he returns, then we'll establish the true caliphate. And it's, for here, read the kingdom, everything that you believe about Jesus coming back. And it's the same thing. Shia and Sunni do not get along. They are not mm -hmm. the only denominations in Islam, but they are the two major ones. Sufism is another. The Sufi are all mystics. Um, and there are some minor minor groups that we won't get into. But, um, I can never, be, can never remember how to say it. It's Ali Yad or Ali something. Um, or in, in, the, in Syria are important. What's his name? The, 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 the king of uh, the president and Assad who belongs to that group. And I can't remember the name of it. And it's got, also got weird ideas. Um, hmm? Alawite, thank you. The Alawites. Um, and, but it, I don't know what the percentages are, but over half the Muslims in the world are Sunni. And they're, they're not crazy. The Shia are, yeah, well, I won't say crazy, but you know, they're the, they're, 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 they expect an apocalypse any day now or are willing to help bring it about. Did you, did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And will that be when the calip their caliphate encompasses the whole world? Yes. When the seventh, I think it is, I, uh, what is his name? What was his name? I forgot. Ali? Uh-uh. Um, it, it doesn't matter. When he comes back, he's hidden away in a cave somewhere. When he comes back, then the kingdom of God comes to earth. I'm, 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 back to I'm not going to, I'm seven. trying to get back on my line of thought here. <laughs> Can't read my hand right. I had a flow going, now it's interrupted. Yes? Uh, a real quick question, but uh, you talked about the Muslims being more accepted than the Jews. Right. But didn't that come with some restrictions? Not as many restrictions as the Christians put on the Jews, number one. Right. And not as many restrictions as, as the Muslims put on the Christians. I mean, uh, uh, Jews are considered by traditional Islam to be almost Muslim. They just acknowledge Muhammad were in the church, right? Uh, but um, Christians, we're a real problem. Uh, uh, the kinds of limitations placed on Jews, though, were, were not. It's, it's interesting that a couple of times, in a couple of places, 
they made Jews wear the yellow badge. Well, Christians had to wear a blue one in those cases. That yellow badge thing, once it got started, everybody, everybody had a latch on the I have a feeling you'll allow me just to summarize henceforward to 1492. The reason I picked that, by the way, is because that's the year when, what happened? Wrong. Well, that's right, but that's not the reason I picked it. That's the year the Moors were kicked out of Spain. And Spain returned, in 711, uh, they conquered Spain. 1492, they were kicked out, finally. And and you know what the Jews did? The Jews were expelled also. The Christians said, we don't want either of them. 1492. All right, my question then is, in relation to what we're talking about overall, where is this ancient enmity between Arab and Jew? I haven't found it yet, have you? And we're in 1492. Oh, by the way, just a couple of odd points that I want to be sure and score, because they, they uh, point to things. 1163, there was a census of Jews in Baghdad, which was at that time the capital of an Umayyad caliphate, right? Which was Sunni. 40,000 Jews in Baghdad doing their deal. You don't have 40,000 people somewhere if you're being oppressed. If they're oppressing you there, you leave. You don't go there. And this Baghdad had a had attracted 40,000 Jews because of the possible. The other date is 1211. 300 rabbis from France and England made Aliyah. That's a word we're going to need to know. Aliyah, A-L-I-Y-A-H. It's a Hebrew word. It comes from the word that means to go up. You know that in, in the Bible, because Jerusalem's on a mountain, it doesn't matter what direction you're going in north, south, east, west. To go to Jerusalem is to go up. Right. In the modern term, which uh, originated that far back, at least, for Jews living in diaspora returning to the Holy Land is Aliyah, to go up. Right. And you say, I'm going to make Aliyah. Uh, and that's true today. At 1211, a bunch of rabbis in France and, and England thought they would be better off under Muslim rule in Palestine than they were in France and England. And so they returned there. Okay. Now, what, what were the points I wanted to make? One, if you're a Jew in the, you know, three, four, five hundred years ago, you better hope you live among Muslims, not among Christians. Two, I don't find the ancient evidence of the ancient enmity that, that is popularly spoken of. Didn't find it in the Bible. I don't find it in history. Not up until 1492, anyway. And we'll see how those things, how things change, and when they change, next week. Uh, questions or comments? About five I'm, minutes. I'm open to anything now. <laughs> Did the Jewish people ever, were they ever in power as the Christians and the Muslims were until modern day Israel? Did they ever really have a state that they controlled? Uh, yes, actually. Not in, uh, the, one of them was the so-called um, Hasmonean monarchy, which wasn't really a monarchy, uh, 164 to 63 BCE. It's the one we associate with Hanukkah. And it was a, uh, the Hasmonean king was recognized as, the Romans had all sorts of different terms for these things. I think as an ethnarch, which means the ruler of an ethnic group. Maybe I should ask, since the Muslim period has. Yes, <laughs> there is what is known as the Khazan kingdom. K-H-A-Z, I think H-A-N, 
640 to 14. <coughs> I may have that in my notes. Let me look. Where was it? It was in the east, east of Massachusetts, Kazan. It was in that, what we call now, Stan, all those Stanny countries. You know, <laughs> in that part of Uh, I don't remember. It, it was a good long while. I want to say 1600s to 1400s. Well, well, would it be safe to say then that typically the Jewish were living under someone else? Yeah, they were. I mean, that's that's why the whole theme of this thing was diaspora. Right. They're living not at home. Yes. Would it be fair to summarize where we are at, at the end of today? 1492. Right, yeah. Right. By saying that. As of that time, there were three major religions in the world. Two of them were tolerant of other religions, and one was not. Okay. Uh, the, the only thing I'd hold up on that is the question of major and how we define it. Because we're talking about a very Western. We're talking about, uh, you know, draw a line from the Mesopotamian River to the Atlantic Ocean. And we're living out in India and all those kind of places. So if we, if you talk about Western religions, and say the three major Western religions, I accept your amendment. Yeah, you're exactly, <laughs> you're exactly, you're exactly right. The, the, the intolerant folks were the Christians. Yes. So there are so many Nobel laureates that are Jewish. Right. And that shows a proclivity toward, you know, education, you know, and an intellect. Right. And so has that permeated through the history that they as a tribe have become that <coughs> astute that they are envied and, and resented by others. Uh, maybe in the say the since the 17 or 1800s. But what's more interesting is how how Jews get to be that way. And the answer to that is through study of the Torah and the Talmud. Because Judaism becomes a, a religion of, of study uh, after the temple is destroyed. There, I mean, this is something we all need to recognize. Much of the Old Testament is about sacrificing the temple and the rituals and right. According to the Old Testament, you can only do that in the temple, and the temple is in Jerusalem, and it's the only place there can be a temple. And there has not been a temple there since 72 AD. So that means you have to, con that means over time, Judaism converted its observance of its religion away from sacrifice and those kind of rituals into study and, and ethical uh, um, ethical observance. And to, to, that's why for, for ages you started, you learned Hebrew and started studying Torah and Talmud at the age of 12. Would a Jewish scholar... Uh, hold on a second. Oh. Question here, question here, then a question here. The question here, yes. Um, before uh, Muhammad became, uh, was around, right. you had Christianity and you had Judaism. And you had all sorts of politics. And all kinds of things. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. How come the, the Jews didn't take a stand? In other words, they were a major religion sort of back then and say, we're going to you know, get people to become Jewish right. at that time. Okay. Okay, let's, let's make sure we understand when we say, this is why I was hesitant about the word major. If you look at, let's pick 600, no, let, yeah, let's pick 611 when, or thereabouts when Muhammad was born. If you mean by major, and it's a significant religion with a large following, then you don't mean Judaism. Yeah, but in, in the Old Testament, they're, they're constantly, they're, you know, sacrificing to have their kingdom and everything like that. How come they weren't fighting to um, have a, some kind of uh, leg up on on other groups? It seems to me that Muhammad, you know, he must have been a very char charismatic uh, kind right. of figure right. to get all these people to get together and right. form a major religion. Uh, let me let me answer your question with, in two ways. And why questions like that are hard in human history? Why didn't the French, you know, you know, who knows why they didn't, they didn't. But uh, there are two factors I think we'd have to have, have played into this. One is, uh, there weren't many Jews in comparison to the larger population. 
they were very clearly a minority, and they were dispersed throughout the world, speaking all of the native languages of where they lived. Secondly, their history beginning with 722 and ending with 135 of standing up to world-class powers had not been good. In other words, they lost to the Assyrians. They lost to the Babylonians three times. They lost to the Romans at least three, and I would argue four times. And then they gave up rebelling and standing up militarily to anybody because it, it hadn't gone well. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, that history of not um, taking up arms in defense of yourself because it hadn't gone well survived on into the Second World War, and there were, there were discussions in Jewish circles about uh, A number of Jews, you know, entered into the underground and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we are uh, still no, we're no we're support we're from the rabbi. Yeah. We're in overtime yeah. now, mm -hmm. so if you need but to if you want to ahead. stay and ask questions, please well, do so. If not, feel free to leave. Yeah, I think right. there was one here. Yeah. One yeah. Yeah. Please feel free to I'm stay. Very interesting Is she taking over the she's taking over Japan? If you if you talk to her, tell her I've been thinking about it. There he is. I mean, you face I still have a couple of questions to ask. Do you see any questions? Yeah. Okay. You can he can jump the questions, right? He, if, he, if he thinks it's inappropriate. Oh, yeah, 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 he can take. I know. That's one of my Is this off? Yes, they're continuing to do well. Is this off? Easter. Uh, no, it's not.